masks are effective. They limit the spread of COVID-19. That is the result of the largest study of masks ever involving nearly 350,000 people across 600 rural villages in Bangladesh. Researchers from the universities of Stanford and Yale found a 30% increase in mask wearing led to a 10% drop in infections. Scientists believe we can't mask our way out of the pandemic, but it is one important layer of protection besides physical distancing, testing and getting vaccinated. Welcome to your COVID-19 special here on DW. I'm Chris Kolber in Berlin. Nowadays, there's even an emoji for it. A round yellow face partially covered by a piece of cloth. Face masks have become a globally recognized symbol of the pandemic. While they've been the subject of political controversy, the simple act of covering your mouth and nose has been and remains an essential tool to limit the spread of the coronavirus. At the beginning of the pandemic, professional masks were in short supply. So people around the world revved up their sewing machines and used handkerchiefs, T-shirts and vacuum cleaner bags to produce DIY masks. And they're still used in many parts of the world. Scientists found that fabric masks afford some protection for the wearer and others, but they usually have an inadequate seal and block only a fraction of the droplets. A fabric mask is better than none, but there are better alternatives such as this simple protective piece for the mouth and nose, known as a surgical mask. It consists of several layers of paper and fabric, with a thin wire to make it fit over the nose. When the wearer coughs or sneezes, the surgical mask blocks the large droplets. But when inhaling, air gets in through the sides. That means it mainly protects others from infection rather than the wearer. There are also so-called filtering face pieces, or FFP masks, which are also worn by medical personnel. They fit snugly around the nose, mouth and chin and filter out the tiniest airborne particles. The most effective type lets no viruses in or out. An exhalation valve makes breathing easier, but increases the risk of viruses escaping. So an unvalved FFP mask protects both best the wearer and those they encounter. No matter which mask you wear, it can only be effective if used with hygiene measures, like thorough hand washing and keeping a safe distance from others. Let's talk more about this with Mashvik Mubarak, Professor of Economics at Yale University in the US state of Connecticut. Welcome to DW. Now you co-authored a study whose message is masks work. Tell us about what you did in order for people in the villages in Bangladesh where you conducted the study to wear these masks. So our study was done in two stages. The first stage is, as you just said, how do we get people to wear masks consistently? And once you get them to wear masks, then we also looked carefully and rigorously at whether that reduces COVID-19 transmission. Now, as anybody who's worked in development knows, it's not easy to get behavior change, uh, persistent behavior change. And so we ended up doing, trying out 20 different strategies and randomized what we tried out in different locations and with different people to see what was most effective. And we came up with a precise combination of four things that seems to work to persistently increase mask wearing. What exactly are these uh, four things that you put into action there? Yeah, so we use the term norm, N-O-R-M, uh, to explain what these four things are because we think it changes social norms. The N stands for no cost mass distribution. So we actually went to the community and went door to door and distributed free masks in rural Bangladeshi communities. And as we were distributing masks, the second O is for offering information. So we made a video where kind of the, you know, the prime minister of the country, the director of the Imam Training Academy, the cricket captain, they recorded some information on why it's important to wear masks and endorsing the concept. And then the M is for role modeling by leaders. So we had to engage community leaders, get their blessings to, to do this mm. work to, so that everybody understood that the whole community was behind it. And finally, for reinforcement, the R, it's that uh, you cannot just distribute masks and leave. You actually have to go back to the village periodically, remind people. So it's 
sort of like, you know, you go, we have a mask right. promoter. If somebody's walking around in the village on the road or in the market, right, without a mask, we go and say, interest at them politely and say, look, we distributed masks everywhere in this village. Why, why aren't you putting yours on? Can you please put it on? If you forgot it, can you go back home and get it? Or right. if that's inconvenient, here's a replacement one. Now, with all the effort that you uh, put in and that you explained to us, um, that effort led to an increase of 30% in mask wearing. Put that into perspective for us, these 30%. Yeah, so that's, um, in some ways, that's a big increase. And the reason is in the control areas where we were monitoring but not doing these uh, interventions, only 13% of people were wearing their mask properly, right? And then that goes up to, when, when it goes up to 42, 45%, that represents a tripling of mask usage. And mm -hmm. we're even more excited by this because not only was it a novelty factor where people put on the mask the day that we distributed them, we continued tracking for 10 weeks, including a period after we left the village completely. And we see that that mask wearing remains at that 40 plus percent point, percentage mm -hmm. point. Now, that led to a 10 percent drop in infections. Is that a lot? Yeah, so when you look at the, so basically you take that 10% drop and you convert it to how cost effective is it for us to save lives, right? It turns out that this is a very cost effective way. It represents a really good investment for governments around the world. And that 10%, you know, another way to put it is that, you know, that's the aggregate effect of different things, such as in some places we tried surgical masks, in other places we tried fabric masks. And as you just pointed out, surgical masks are more effective, which is also what we find. It's more higher filtration efficiency, it saves more lives. Mm -hmm. And we find that the surgical masks are particularly effective in preventing infection among the elderly. So for people above the age of 60, it eliminated a third of all infections, and which is very, very large. Now, with the results of your study now public, will this sort of intervention be conducted elsewhere as well? Yeah, so even before I publicized the results with the world at large with the international media, right? We, as soon as we started seeing the positive effects, immediately we went into action when the crisis hit India in a big way, you remember a few months ago, right? And we started uh, sharing our protocols to make it easy for governments to implement. And I'm happy to report that already, uh, even before the study was publicized, we've now been distributing masks to over 100 million people in Bangladesh, Nepal, Pakistan, India, and also now in Latin America and starting in Africa. Mashvik, as uh, you've become somewhat of an expert uh, in mask wearing, tell us again, in which situations should they be worn and where do they have no effect? Yeah, and I want to be careful that, you know, in our case, uh, you know, the mask intervention was done everywhere all at once. So it, I cannot experimentally separate that, oh, you know what, it's indoors that work and outdoors that work. Because in our case, we distributed the mask at mosques, which is an indoor mm -hmm. setting, but also at outdoor markets, etc. So one of the one of the key lessons I would take away from this is that even though rural Bangladesh is a quite outdoors place, life is generally lived outdoors, even in a setting like this, where masks are least likely to work, we see large effects. That means in indoor places, it's probably likely to have even larger effects. And based on the research in general, not just from our study, hmm. uh, it suggests that indoor transmission risk is high, and that's where you should be most careful about wearing masks. Mashrik Mubarak of Yale University, thank you. Thank you. And here's a look at some of the other developments in the coronavirus pandemic. The European Union has committed 200 million additional coronavirus vaccine doses to African nations. EU Commission President Ursula von der Leyen said the new donation would be fully delivered by the middle of next year and comes on top of 250 million jabs already committed. Students in Brussels have been unenthusiastic about getting vaccinated. Just 44% have gotten the jab. Now the regional government is preparing to make the health pass mandatory for entering bars and restaurants in a bid to push its young population to get the jab. After 15 months, tourists are returning to the Thailand's vacation island of Phuket. It's part of the Sandbox pilot program in the popular resort. Travelers don't need to quarantine, but they do need proof of vaccination and a negative COVID-19 test. And now it's time for our science correspondent, Derek Williams, answering your questions about the pandemic. Is there a correlation between long COVID and obesity? Carrying around too much weight, experts agree, is, is not good for your long-term health generally. 
And of course, the more you carry, the more serious the effects it can eventually have. Um, a number of studies have shown that during an active infection with SARS-CoV-2, excess weight in an adult increases the chances that that person will experience a serious outcome. Um, the reasons for that are complicated, but um, according to the CDC in the US, they include the fact that a, a higher BMI or, or body mass index is linked to negative impacts, for example, on things like immune function and, and lung capacity. So with acute COVID-19, excess weight can substantially increase the risk of hospitalization or ending up in the ICU or dying from the disease. However, it's taken longer and proven trickier to tie a high BMI to, to long COVID, um, the syndrome where persistent symptoms continue to pop up in people who've had COVID-19 uh, for weeks or, or even months after an infection. Um, a study carried out by American researchers back in June was one of the first to indicate that those who are obese are indeed at greater risk of developing long COVID than those who aren't. And, and that conclusion appears to be backed up by data from the large-scale long-term COVID symptom study, which tracks symptoms in COVID patients in, in Britain. Um, I'd say from what I've read that, that many experts seem to be pretty confident that obesity does increase the chances that a patient will develop long COVID, but the evidence is not yet overwhelming. 